I'd like to um, welcome you all to today's program, Understanding Breast Cancer, brought to you by the East Brunswick Public Libraries Just for the Health of It program in partnership with Astera Cancer Care. We are honored to have today's presenter, Dr. Sunda Sabasi, physician at the Breast Center at St. Peter's University Hospital. The library is so appreciative when doctors such as Dr. Abbasi realize the importance of health literacy and how educated patients are empowered to ask their doctors the right questions, understand their choices, and work alongside their doctor for a successful outcome. Dr. Abbasi has a very distinguished biography. She completed her residency at St. Joseph's University Medical Center. She is a member of the American College of Surgeons, Society of Surgical Oncology, and the American Society of Breast Surgeons. She completed a fellowship at MD Anderson Cancer Center at Cooper University Hospital, and her areas of interest include benign breast disease and breast cancer. Dr. Abbasi has offices located in Monroe and also in New Brunswick at the Breast Center at St. Peter's University Hospital. Now, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Abbasi. All right, hello everyone. This is just a picture of me, you know, we're meeting via okay. Zoom now, things have changed during COVID. So Karen, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so my talk, um, this is just the overview of it. We're gonna go over the risks for breast cancer, screening and imaging, treatment and advances, high risk screening. But just like Karen was saying, I thought this talk was so important to give because it's very important to know why you are having certain exams done and what the importance of that is. I feel like advocating for yourself and having knowledge when you're at a doctor's visit. And sometimes it's hard when you're in that initial visit because you have a lot of new terms thrown at your way. You have a lot of new information that comes your way. And it's really hard to process all that in the moment. So I'm hoping that there are people on this call who have either just had a appointment with a breast surgeon or going to see a breast surgeon or have been there with a loved one who has, you know, gone through all of this together. And I'm hoping that this talk reiterates some fine points or helps you learn a little bit more. Because, you know, at the end of the day, being an advocate for yourself goes a very, very long way. And that comes with knowledge. Um, and that first appointment with your breast surgeon can be so overwhelming. From the second that you hear that you have an abnormal mammogram going forward, everything just feels like a whirlwind. And my patients only remember a fraction of what they hear in their appointments. So I, I hope this talk really helps you reorganize your information or solidify um, knowledge that you already knew. So I wanna start off with is, you know, when you get your mammogram report, what are we talking about when we look at the breast? So this is just an image of what we are talking about as breast surgeons when we look at the breast. So this is just a, a picture, um, you know, a drawing of the breast. But when we're talking about the breast, we're talking about a component that is fatty tissue and fibrous tissue that has ducts that all terminate at your nipple. So that whole region from your clavicle down is what we're talking about when we say breast tissue. And if you look at these green little circles all around the breast, that's the lymphatic drainage of the breast, the majority of which goes to your axillary nodes. So if you've already had a breast appointment, you know that we are checking your entire breast, but we're also looking at those lymph nodes because what the breast drains through those lymph nodes and the majority of which, like I said, are going to those axillary lymph nodes, so the ones underneath your arm. So that exam provides us valuable information about what may be going on in your breast. So that is the framework for what we're covering when you have your initial breast appointment. And then I put a little clock here because, you know, when you get your mammogram report, it's, it's not a common terminology that they use, but what they're looking at is if the middle of this clock was your nipple and they're counting based on your right or left side, what o'clock it is. So if it's three o'clock from the nipple, if it's six o'clock from the nipple and they measure how many centimeters therefore it is from the nipple. So when you get a, um, we can go back to the picture of the breast. So 
when you get your report and it says something three o'clock, five centimeters from the nipple, it sounds like a different language, but really it's what the radiologists are using when they combine your mammogram and your ultrasound together to create a image of where this mass could be on your breast. Can we, is this the next slide or can we go back one? I think you're going forward. Can we go? Okay. Yeah. You might have to hit escape and exit the um, slideshow view. Okay. And then just scroll up. Perfect. And go to the slide that says breast cancer. This one? The one on um, underneath mm -hmm. the anatomy slide. Yeah. Perfect. And then just go um, from the top left, it says from current slide, the slideshow. Karen, do you see that bar at the top where it says from beginning and it says from current slide? Yes. And so just so, okay. You might just have to click forward a few slides. From current slide. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. We've had technical difficulties. From beginning. Okay. From beginning. Yeah, you can click from beginning and just click. Uh, you can click right on your uh, cursor, and then we can go to the slide that's after the anatomy slide. So slide five, please. Okay. Slide five. Yep. Yes, and now you can click from current slide at the top. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So just a little bit about breast cancer. So the average lifetime risk of a woman in the United States is 12.3. So that's saying one out of eight women in the United States has breast cancer, which is alarming. But we're learning that although it's the most commonly diagnosed cancer in women, the death rates continue to fall 1.8% each year. And that's the most recent data that the NCCN, which is the National Cancer Guidelines, has really um, noticed that although we are diagnosing more women with breast cancer, this death rate is really coming down, which is great news. And what that's attributed is what you guys are all doing on a consistent basis, which is getting your mammograms, getting your screening mammograms, going for your appointments, and all these treatment advances that we have. The way that we treat breast cancer now is completely different than how we used to treat it. And I get so excited about it because before we were taking out muscle, we were taking out entire breasts, we weren't giving women options. Now there's a lot of options available and it's really changed how we treat breast cancer. We can go to the next slide, please. She said next slide, so I think you just click it. Or if you have a right arrow on, oh, that's perfect too. Okay. Great. So when I look at, when we look at breast cancer, I like to look at it as what are preventable and not preventable risk factors, because there's a lot of things that we can do to help decrease our risk of having breast cancer. So things that are preventable, obesity. So maintaining a healthy BMI is very important because especially when you're postmenopausal, when you're premenopausal, meaning before menopause, the majority of your estrogen is coming from your ovaries. When you have gone through menopause, a lot of your estrogen is now coming from the peripheral conversion of your body from fats. So when you maintain a healthy BMI, it can help decrease that peripheral conversion of these estrogens. And that is one of the directed therapies that we have for breast cancer in postmenopausal women is stopping that peripheral conversion of estrogen. So maintaining a good healthy weight is very important. Breast density, what does that mean? Is it preventable or not? That is more put there. You can't prevent the way that your breasts are dense. You are either have extremely dense breasts or you have fatty breasts, but knowing that information that your breasts are dense can help um, lead to more testing or more definitive testing for your breasts 
And that comes from having knowledge of knowing what does it mean if someone says my breasts are dense. So some people on your report, it'll say, oh, you have very dense breasts. And that means that when we look at mammograms, and I'll show you a picture of a mammogram so you know what I'm talking about, but dense tissue shows up white. When we see issues with the breast, it also shows up white. So when both are superimposed on each other, it's a little bit harder for us to detect whether or not there's something there. In people who have a high risk history or in people who have any concerning um, history that would lead us to be thinking that, hey, they're at a higher risk of developing breast cancer, we can supplement these mammograms with additional testing like ultrasound and MRI. But it, what it comes to is identifying those patients first. The other preventable risk factor is alcohol. So now decreasing your level of alcohol has been shown to help decrease your chance of having breast cancer and smoking. Smoking causes these toxins within your body and a lot of cancers are linked to smoking. So decreasing and even better stopping smoking can help decrease your chance of breast cancer. And then there's a lot of risk factors that you can't prevent. A lot of women, the only reason that they have breast cancer is because we're living longer, which is great. But the longer you live, the higher you have a lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. And most of the time when women come to my office, that is their only risk factor is that they're a woman and that they have lived a long life. But that being said, those women who are older and living a long life ha have more favorable cancers. And so th that goes into the treatment, but not necessarily just because you're living longer means that you're gonna end up with a bad breast cancer. So being a female, 100 times more likely to have breast cancer than men. Race, highest in Caucasian women, and there's a higher chance of having regionally, meaning locally advanced cancer among African-American women. And that goes into health disparities. Family history, when you have a higher, uh, when you have family members, especially first degree family members who have breast cancer, that weighs a lot into your risk of having breast cancer. There are certain genetic mutations. Now we're, we're, very liberal with our use of genetic testing amongst our breast patients. And we're learning more and more about these genes that can predispose certain patients to developing breast cancer. So now we have this, all this information that can help us identify high-risk patients. And then if you were younger and had any exposure to ionizing radiation, this can significantly increase your chance of having breast cancer. We can go to the next slide. There are certain risk models that we also look at whenever we see new patients that look at what is a patient's risk of developing breast cancer and help identifying high-risk patients. So earlier menarche. So it's looking at your overall estrogen exposure throughout your life. So late menopause, early menarche kind of go together. And that's just going to when your menstrual cycle, when it started, when did it end? Not having children. So having children and, you know, and it actually looks at what your age was when you had your first child. So you might hear us asking you that when you have your first appointment and giving birth to children causes this equilibrium within your breast tissue that we have learned that has been a protective effect. Um, so not having any children or increased age of first birth can risk it can be causing you to have an increased risk for having breast cancer when we look at one of our risk models. And then your number of previous biopsies, and especially if your previous biopsy detected any atypical tissue, that can also increase your chance of having breast cancer. Next slide, please. And what are the symptoms? So I will tell you a lot of patients come in and they actually felt their breast mass. And, you know, nowadays there is this saying that breast awareness is important before, and you know, American Cancer Society was saying, you know, um, doing breast exams on a regular basis. They didn't really know if that was well supported, but just to be aware of your breast. But I will tell you, women who examine their breast 
no differences in their breath. There is no one who knows your body better than yourself. We will get acquainted with your breasts when we first meet you, but you know your breasts on a day-to-day -day level. You know how they have changed through each year. You know when something is not correct. And so I really advocate, there's this saying that I'm going to also reiterate at the end called feel it on the first. And I learned that from one of the radiologists during my fellowship. And it's the first of every month, just acquaint yourself with your breast, take a feel, see what you feel. And it's true. Yes. Sometimes when women first examine their breasts, they feel a lot of lumps and bumps, and that just might be the natural arch architecture of your breast. But it's good to know the next month, oh, this feels exactly the same to me. Oh, this is my breast. That knowledge yeah. And being able to do a good breast exam is very important. The other thing is changes in your shape and your size of your breast. So some women will come in and say, oh, you know, my breast, it used to, uh, my bra, it used to fit. And now it just does not fit anymore. My breast seems bigger on this side. And that could be a symptom of having a breast cancer. So please don't ignore that if that happens. Nipple discharge. So we worry about, when we talk about nipple discharge, the discharge that we worry about is the one that is coming from one breast and it is coming spontaneously. So it's not coming during sexual intercourse. It's not coming from manual manipulation of your nipples. It is when you just notice it coming for no good reason. When you take off your bra and you notice some crusting within your bra that you've never noticed before. And sometimes that nipple discharge, it can be a variation of color. So sometimes it can be green, sometimes it can be clear, and sometimes it can be bloody. Regardless, if it's something that you have never noticed before, I would ask you to please escalate it to a provider and have that, have that looked at. Other changes, so skin changes. Sometimes you may start noticing that you, the area around your nipple becomes crusted or your, bread beco uh, your breast becomes red all of a sudden or some areas of your breast become thickened all of a sudden that you've never noticed before. Those are all symptoms of what could be a breast cancer. Next slide. Thank you. So the breast cancer screening, so the screening mammogram, no one likes to go for their mammogram. I wish I wish I could invent or I wish someone would invent a, some way to make these mammograms enjoyable or at least more tolerable for women. It is not something people look forward to, but the screening mammogram is associated with breast cancer mortality reduction. And the recommendation is for age 40 and earlier in high-risk patients. And the high-risk patients are the ones who are put into those risk models or have a high risk family history. And those are the ones that we screen starting earlier than 40. And what the screening mammogram does, it causes early diagnosis of breast cancer. So the mammogram can detect a lesion two years before a clinical exam can. And interval cancers are lower among women who are annually screened, meaning cancers that can happen with every in between those yearly mammograms are lower in women who are consistently getting screened. And I will tell you, your first screening mammogram, and this does happen, is the first time the radiologist is also getting acquainted with your breast. They have never seen what your breast looks like on a mammogram. So do not be scared if they say, hey, this looks a little bit suspicious. Oh, this doesn't look right. And you may say, oh my God, I'm only 40 and I just got this mammogram done. A lot of times what radiologists like to do is compare your previous mammogram to the next mammogram, to the most current mammogram you have. And if you don't have any data beforehand and you're just getting your first screening mammogram, they may say alert, alert, alert to a lot of different findings, which may end up to be nothing. So don't let that deter you from going in for your screening mammogram. I will tell you, it's very, very sad. COVID has affected so many aspects of our lives, our normal daily functioning, our social interactions, our emotional well-being. And unfortunately, it has significantly impacted the amount of women who go for their screening mammograms. And I will tell you, there are so many women who come in who say, oh, I didn't get a mammogram in 2020. I didn't get a mammogram in 2021. And now they're presenting now with a mass on their mammogram.
that wasn't previously there from their prior mammograms. And it's so unfortunate because this is such a preventable or a cancer that we can detect so early that it's just unfortunate that COVID is starting to wreck that. It is safe to go in for your mammograms now. They're screening people, people are wearing masks, they're cleaning after every single mammogram. So please, please, please do not let COVID deter you anymore from your screening mammogram. I cannot tell you, if you only take one thing away from my talk, well, please take two things at least, is feel it on the first and also the COVID impact on these screening mammograms and get your mammogram done. And I will tell you that a lot of women, they get that phone call and it says, hey, we saw something on your screening mammogram. We need you to come back for additional views. No one likes to get that phone call. It is scary, scary, scary. But less than 10% of those calls are related to malignancy. So a lot of times it is they see something on your mammogram that they may have not seen and before, and it ends up being completely benign. Or it may not even show up when they do additional views on your breast because the screening mammogram is just two quick views of your breast. The diagnostic, what they ask you to come back is additional views. And what they're doing is seeing, does that area persist when they also compress in multiple views? And if it doesn't, it's not something that we investigate further or it's something that we follow at a later time, six months from now. So less than 10% of these callbacks are related to malignancy. So please do not let that deter you either. And do not get too worried when you get that phone call. Next, please. So this is a picture of your mammogram. And I, I love our practice at uh, St. Peter's and Monroe because we will sit down with you and actually show you your imaging and show you what your breasts look like. And that is so important because you will just get a sheet of paper that says, hey, this is your report. Your breasts look like this and this is what we saw. But knowing what they're looking for and knowing what your own breasts look like gives you so much clarity and helps you become an advocate for yourself. So a mammogram is just x-rays of your breast. So this is just showing us breast density. So if you can appreciate all these white areas, I wish I could use my mouse, but these white area on the breast compared to the more darkened area, that is the density of the breast. And that is what I'm saying. When you have extremely dense breasts, that white area can get superimposed another white area. And it's a little harder to see in those situations. And it also looks as calcification. So if you look on the left side, you see all these white large circles, those are calcifications. And when we're looking at calcifications, just because you have one does not mean that it's cancer related, but there are certain types of calcifications, the ones that are grouped together, the ones that are varying in shape that lead us to early stage breast cancer, meaning non-invasive breast cancer. And that's what we're really looking for when we look at your mammogram is can we identify the early formings of breast cancer? Also, they look at asymmetries and you may see that word used often. What asymmetry is in a view of your breast, the tissue is laying a little bit, tissue, a little bit different than the surrounding tissue or a little bit different than what it previously looked like when, when they're comparing mammograms. And then look at distortions. Distortions are when that asymmetry is persisting in multiple views and is distorting your tissue. But that is what they're looking at when you do your mammogram. And I will show you next what an ultrasound looks like and you'll see how that gives us even more information about what's going on in your breast. We can go to the next slide, please. So this is an ultrasound. So you can see completely different than what we were just looking at because this is not an X-ray. There's no radiation with ultrasound. And if you look at the very top of here, and I apologize because we're having a technical difficulty with my mouse, but in the left image, if you can appreciate the very top, there's this thin sliver of lighter, uh, it's like a lighter thin sliver than what's underneath it. That is your skin. And if you can appreciate towards the bottom, there's this thickened band area. So it looks like these striated lines, that's your muscle behind your breast. So in between is your breast tissue and smack in the middle, you can notice there's this darkened area. That darkened area is what masses look like that we're concerned about on ultrasound. 
And on mammogram, it just may look like a white area or a tissue distortion. But the ultrasound is what really gives us a really nice picture of the surrounding uh, margins of what it looks like. Does it look like a complete circle? If you look at the image all the way on the right, see how you can see that border really well? It looks like a complete circle. Compare that to what you see on the left-hand side. You can't really make out the border on the left-hand side. So those are the characteristics we're looking at when we're looking at these ultrasounds. We're also looking, what is it looking like inside? Is it solid or is it fluid? And what type of shadowing? If you can appreciate on the left side, it has this darkened shadowing to it, which is when we start getting concerned about breast cancers. And if you look on the right side, it's a completely different colored shadowing. And that's what we kind of see with benign lesions like cysts. So the ultrasound really provides us a lot more information. So when someone tells you, hey, we're calling you back for an ultrasound and a diagnostic mammogram, what that means is they're gonna take a few more x-rays of your breast to see if something persists or if they can still see it in many views. And they're doing this ultrasound because it's providing them data of can they appreciate any sort of mass underneath. And sometimes it's something benign like a cyst and sometimes it's something more worrisome like a breast cancer. We can go to the next slide, please. And then some of you, and if it, you may, it may have already had this, have a breast MRI. So this is the most detailed look of a, of a breast. And you can see how it looks very different than the mammogram and very different than the ultrasound. And you can see this white ball here. So what the MRI does is they give you an IV and they inject contrast. And that contrast goes to areas that are hypervascular. Those areas can be benign or they can be malignant. But what the MRI especially does is highlight areas of malignancy because cancers like to steal blood and they like to thrive on extra blood flow. So that is what it's really highlighting there is a mass associated with retaining contrast when the surrounding breast has washed out its contrast. But I will tell you, MRI also leads to more benign breast biopsy. So if you have an MRI and you get called back, hey, there's something concerning and it's completely off chart of the area that you were even worried about, this MRI is so sensitive that it can also increase your chance of having benign breast biopsies but it also provides additional information. So when your provider says, hey, I think you would benefit from getting an MRI, and we use MRIs in a lot of our high-risk patients because it can help really identify masses early, they're doing it because it's providing a more information that the mammogram and ultrasound may not necessarily be providing. Okay, we can do next, please. So you'll get your report and you'll get this at the very end, it's gonna give you impression and it's gonna give you this BIRAD scaling system. And this is just a scaling system by the radiologist based on what they saw on your mammogram, ultrasound or your MRI, okay? And it's graded. And these are all just percentages. So is it negative, benign, probably benign, suspicious, highly suggestive, Six is when you've already had a biopsy that has shown malignancy and you're getting additional testing like an MRI afterwards. But I will tell you about when something is negative or benign, usually you're not seeing a breast specialist. When something becomes BIRADS three and above, that's when you're seeing a breast specialist, whether it's, whether it's the APN that's in our, in our uh, practice or it's one of the breast surgeons, that is when you're looking at masses that are probably benign but need to be seen in six months. And when you're going to level four, that's when we're start looking at, hey, this, could, this is something we need to investigate with a biopsy. But if you look at that range, two to 90, less than 95%, that is a huge range. So a lot of women, and I have seen this, get the report, it sounds like a different language, but it is really just radiology terms to identify who needs to be followed and who needs a biopsy. And I will tell you, when you get to BIRADS4 and it says surgical consultation recommended, biopsy recommended, do not freak out. That does not mean that this is going to be a breast cancer. You see that range of two to less than 95%. 
And that being said, some people, when you get that buyer rights five and it says greater than 95%, this is based on just your imaging. When you see the provider, and I will tell you our practice, we see patients before they have their biopsy and it makes a huge difference because we can sit with you, talk to you, show your imaging, and do the clinical exam because this is just a picture of what is going on with you. You need your breast examined by a provider to see, does this match up with what's going on and what we're feeling in your breast? Next, please. So then going forward, biopsies. There's a few different types of biopsies that we get. There's a needle biopsy, and that's usually the first step. So that is done by the radiologist. They will recreate the image either by mammogram, ultrasound, or MRI, and they will numb up your skin and they'll pass a needle through. This is something you can drive yourself to, drive yourself back to. You're not receiving anesthesia through an IV. It's just local anesthesia. And it takes about an hour and they put a little clip there. Sometimes people get scared of this clip. You're not gonna go off at the airport, like nothing, nothing is gonna happen with this clip. It's a very tiny, tiny clip. You're not gonna feel it. You may feel bruising after your biopsy, which is common, but this clip is used because then we know, hey, this is an area in the breast that we were previously concerned about that we biopsied, or this is the area in the breast. We know that it's concerning and now we have to go take it out. Next slide, please. And now we can talk about breast cancer. This is my favorite picture of trying to understand what's going on with breast cancer within your breast. So there's different types. So there's DCIS, which is non-invasive breast cancer is how I like to think about it. And I'll show you in the picture why it's non-invasive, but this is the in situ breast cancer. Then there's the invasive type. There can be ductal, lobular. There's many subtypes of breast cancer but I want you to think of it this way. So if you look at the top of the picture, you have these ducts that are terminating at your nipple. So see the circle, just follow the arrow and it has one duct and then it has a lobular lobule at the end. So think of you're looking in a pipe, okay? And now you're cutting that pipe in half. So if you look at the bottom picture, that is us looking through the pipe. That pipe is your duct, okay? So within that duct, there's normal, epithelial lining that we're looking for. When you start having atypical cells in that duct, um, surrounding that duct, they will start growing and they will start causing some changes in that area. But they are just atypical hyperplasia, meaning it's just more of those cells. When you start getting the cancer cells and we're crossing over now into that dotted line where those black cancer cells are there, but they're still confined within that duct. So they're still confined within that pipe. That is DCIS. It has not broken free into your surrounding tissue. So that is a non-invasive breast cancer. It is confined within that duct. When it starts breaking free of the duct, so the next picture over, that's when we start talking about our, our invasive cancers. And then when the duct goes into your bloodstream, that is when we start talking about metastatic breast cancer because now it has traveled through your bloodstream and gotten to other portions of our body. So if you look at it at the basic level, like you're cutting straight through a pipe and looking at a duct, that is what's going on inside your breast. Next slide, please. And then you get, you know, once you have a diagnosis of breast cancer, we like to know what is feeding this breast cancer the vast majority of it is gonna be estrogen and progesterone. So just hormones in your body. You can't really help those hormones in your body unless you're postmenopausal and having a healthy BMI, but it's good information for us to know because through the years we've learned that we can give you medications to help attack those things and receptors that are feeding this breast cancer. The other thing to look at is a HER2. This is a growth factor that some breast cancers are love, love, and love to be feed it on. So that growth factor, knowing if you're positive for it is very important because the treatment for it has revolutionized the treatment of HER2 positive breast cancer and has caused women significant results. So that's another risk factor. Then there's the triple negative breast cancer. That's the one that's not being fed by any of those breast cancers. 
which is can present as a more aggressive cancer, but still there's treatment for that triple negative breast cancer. And then you'll get a number that says KI67. It's just a percentage for us to know about how fast things are multiplying. How quickly are these cancer cells multiplying within your breast? Next slide, please. And then you have a team of people. So this is why I went into breast surgery because I love the team of people that go into it. I wanted to go into a field where I felt like I had team members with me that I could talk to, that we could all take care of one patient together. And there's a, com a camaraderie. So you have your breast surgeon. I lifted it first because I'm a breast surgeon, but I am only a small portion of the team. There's a radiologist who helped identify that there was an issue. There's a medical oncologist. There's a radiation oncologist. Some people may benefit from radiation. There's a plastic surgeon. Um, now we're allowing women to have reconstruction with their breast cancer diagnosis which has changed a lot of the emotional um, and physical changes that happen when you get a diagnosis. There's a genetic counselor, there's a social worker, there's a team of people involved. Next, please. And then the surgical treatment. So I alluded to this before, but before, in the, back in the years of Halstead, we were taking out the entire breast. When and, you know, breast cancer, it takes something away from you. It takes something away from you, your family members, and we want to be able to preserve who you are as best as we can. And so now we're able to, when certain situations offer women breast conservation, and that is only taking out a portion of your breast. And that is sometimes supplemented with radiation or other adjunct, adjunct um, treatments, but we are able to take a small portion of the breast instead of the whole breast and know that it doesn't really change the survival. Then there's different types of mastectomies. Before we were just taking out the entire breast. Now we can save people's nipples. We can save people the majority of their skin. We can allow reconstruction. Or we may in some instances, depending on what type of cancer you have, still have to take out your entire breast because of where it's involved. But we have options now. We can provide people options and that is a huge deal. The other thing is when you have a breast cancer diagnosis, going back to that first picture we saw when we looked at those lymph nodes, we have to get some data on if any of those cancer cells have gone to those gatekeeper lymph nodes underneath your arm. So we do sample those lymph nodes and the sampling depends on the extent of the disease. And that's something that you will have a conversation with your breast surgeon about of how many lymph nodes need to be sampled. And then the reconstruction options. And now there's also, you know, women who have larger breasts can also at the same time get oncoplastic reductions. So that same breast they have cancer can also get reduced and they can get a contralateral reduction at the same time. So it's, it's not just dealing with your cancer, but it's also figuring out what do you feel comfortable with? How do you want your breast to look like after all this? Because in the end, it took something away from you. So now it's time for us to give something back to you. Next slide, please. And this is just going on, you know, because it's a team effort, there's radiation involved sometimes. It can be to your breast, to your, ex, to your lymph node. Some people need chemotherapy, although we have, we have certain tests that help identify those patients better. So we're not giving everyone chemotherapy now. And some people, like I said, in the vast majority have that hormone positive breast cancer and so we have these anti-hormone treatments to help decrease the risk of developing breast cancer in the future and decrease your chance of recurrence. Next, please. Then I just wanna go quickly over high-risk screening. And this is, you know, we, we put all your information into these risk factor. Um, there's one based on majority family history. There's one based on what we talked about, about your, uh, when you went to menopause, your menstrual cycle, all that. But women greater than 35 with a five-year risk greater than 1.7, so that's the Gale model that I showed before, or lifetime risk greater than 10, 20 based on family health, history. And these high-risk lesions, meaning LCIS, which is lobular carcinoma in situ, which can increase your chance of breast cancer in the breast that was detected in, and the contralateral breast. And these atypical hyperplasias can cause you to have a lifetime risk greater than 20%, which is greater than the general population. And so you may be a candidate 
for getting MRIs every single year, um, six months alternating with your mammograms that can help detect lesions early. This is not to say that you are going to absolutely develop breast cancer. These are not what these risk models are for. These risk models are for us to help identify patients who would benefit from high-risk screening so we can help identify if any changes happen early. And like I said before, women who had thoracic radiation for uh, about 10 to 30 years old, so if they had an issue of Hodgkin's lymphoma, they had a significantly increased risk for having breast cancer. And if you had a genetic predisposition, so these will all be indications for you to see some sort of breast specialist for a high risk screening um, treatment plan. Next, please. So what now? So I gave you this information. I'm hoping that it allowed you to see what we're looking for when we see you. It gives you some information on how to be an advocate for yourself. So what can you do now going forward? Be aware of your breasts. Know what is going on. You are your biggest advocate. I will tell you so many women come in and say, hey, I noticed this change in my breast and I, I just think it's small, but you know, do you mind taking a look at it? And it ends up being something. So even if it's just a small thing, Get it checked out. You always see it. You're taking care of yourself. You're telling your doctor every single day. Please just be aware of your doctor. And I love that saying, feel it on the first. It's easy to remember. Oh, today's March 1st. Perfect. You can go after this talk and take a feel of your breast and, you know, get acquainted with what it feels like if you haven't yet. And if you just focus on one day of the month, it's easier to remember it uh, to memorize. And then the breast self exam can help so much. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, do you mind just going to that last slide? Oh, thank you. Um, the other thing is do not delay your screening mammograms. It is so important to get your screening mammograms. And I'm hoping that now you see what a mammogram looks like. Now that you know that less than 10% of callbacks are because of malignancy, it will not deter you from going because more just think of it this way. It is just more knowledge to know what is going on. And based on their knowledge, there's always options once you see a breast specialist to figure out what's going on.